In 2016, I traveled from Canada to America by bike. From Banff in the Canadian Rockies to Missoula, Montana, we'll survive the ride, a grizzly bear encounter, and Giardia. And all along the way, biking fully self-supported over two weeks and 600 miles to some of the most beautiful and untouched nature in all of America. Stay tuned and hit that subscribe button because you're not going to want to miss this four-part series. This is Getaway. Make sure to check out the previous three episodes. But now let's get back to day 11 on the world's longest off-road bike route. I awoke feeling my energy restored and we headed out along rural farm roads down south to Big Fork, Montana and Wayfair State Park where we'd be camping for the night. I was looking forward to Big Fork as it was supposedly a beautiful lakefront vacation town. The ride was enjoyable and flat as we passed by a lot of nice farms and homesteads, one of which advertised free camping for divide riders, which I appreciated. As we got much closer to the lake, the scenery changed and the beautiful vacation homes started becoming more frequent. We finally arrived in Big Fork and pulled into Wayfair State Park. It was a beautiful campground right on the water and I was surprised to see bike-specific camping spots complete with bike repair stands. It was super neat to see how much infrastructure is built up in response to the divide. After settling down at camp, we headed out to have some dinner at the Flathead Lake Brewing Co. Pub House. It was a nice walk alongside the lake to the restaurant. Now, we did actually have to cross uh, alongside traffic, basically this bridge at one point. Uh, there were tons of little lakefront houses and everything, and the restaurant overlooked the whole place. Dinner was great, and it felt especially good to eat again after being sick. Despite the short stop, I really enjoyed Big Fork. The community is cute, and the location is picturesque. Not to mention, upon further research, the history is pretty cool too. The area around Big Fork was initially settled by homesteaders and loggers in the late 1800s. The primary industry, being logging, was tied to Big Fork's growth and the establishment of sawmills in the early 1900s. In the early 20th century, the construction of dams and hydroelectric plants along the Swan River brought electricity to Big Fork and the surrounding area. As the natural beauty of the Flathead Lake and the surrounding mountains became more widely appreciated, it started to attract more tourists. The town's scenic location on the shores of the Flathead Lake made an ideal vacation destination. Today, it's a charming village known for its art galleries, boutiques, restaurants, and recreational opportunities. It seems to remain a popular tourist destination, particularly during the summer months when visitors are here to enjoy the lake and all the outdoor activities. Awaking the next day, we packed up and headed off south into the hills east of Flathead Lake and west of Scenic Highway 83. This is the next stretch and it would take us down Force Roads over a pass into the Swan River Valley where we would spend a night camping on the river before heading south. As we climbed the pass, the strength and energy I had lost from my sickness became more apparent. It wasn't that it was a steep climb, but it was a consistent grade for hours, and there really wasn't any scenery. After a bit of suffering, we finally made it to the top of the pass, and I started a long coast downhill into the river valley. I was exhausted when we finally arrived at a beautiful campsite along the Swan River. We pitched our tent just a few feet from the water. After a long day, we quickly drifted to sleep at the sounds of the river. We woke the next day and headed out further along the forest road. Today would be a relatively short ride as we would be continuing down south past Condon and then east across Highway 83 onto a paved road leading to Holland Lake. After a more relaxed day of riding and having gotten back into the flow of biking every day, we turned left 
down a gravel road and arrived at Holland Lake. Holland Lake was absolutely gorgeous and it was heavily developed as a tourist destination. We were able to use the RV flow up hoses for a shower and we had time to enjoy the lake. There was a super nice campground we set up alongside and an incredible lodge we ended up checking out. Holland Lake is also the base of a mountain range and it's fed by a waterfall, making it quite the scenic spot. The next day we headed south out along one of the many forest roads leading from Holland Lake. Continuing southwest, we started to enjoy beautiful vista as we climbed an elevation. Turns out, today would be the highest ascent of our trip, and that first few hours would consist of switchbacks as we made our way up high into the mountains. Now this ride was hard, but unlike the previous big climb, this one was super rewarding. The views on this stretch were truly incredible, as we looked back down upon lakes in the valley and appreciated the progress we had made. When we eventually reached the summit of the pass, the road turned into tight single track and we navigated along the edge of the ridge line. Eventually the single track gave way to a clearing. We were blessed with a perfect view down into the two valleys on opposite side of the pass. After taking a celebratory photo, we turned and began the long ascent down into the next valley. Woohoo! Now that descent was one of my favorite parts of the trip, as we were blessed with over a solid hour of consistent downward grade, complete with some fun, easy single track. It was also at this moment that it really made me appreciate the fact that bikepacking has some real advantages over motorcycle packing, bike packing, or overlanding. With bikepacking, you can cover much more ground than backpacking, but not too much ground that you're going to move too fast to appreciate what you cover. It's also quiet like backpacking, but you're not staring at your feet the whole time, and you don't have to carry your gear on your back like backpacking. And most importantly, you get the fun of the descents. If you haven't tried bikepacking, I highly recommend it. Like when I was getting into it back in 2016, 2015, there weren't that many options. But nowadays, there's so many amazing adventure bikes and so many options for gear and bags. So I highly recommend it. There's, there's, there's plenty of routes out there. So just get out there and go. Eventually, our descent flattened as we re-entered into the Swan Valley and we rode down into the town of Seely Lake. That day's ride was a special one, and it would mark the end of our journey outside of civilization. You see, tomorrow will be our last day of riding, as we will be making the final push from Seely Lake to Missoula. To celebrate our accomplishment and the impending conclusion of our adventure, we went to dinner on the bank of Seely Lake at Lindsay's Prime Steakhouse, a local favorite. The steaks and mushrooms were good, and they really hit the spot after a long day of riding. We also got to try a pickled watermelon, which supposedly is a popular palate cleanser at this establishment. We didn't end up spending much time in Seagu Lake, but as always, I did some research, and I was interested to find that Seely Lake has a deep history that starts with Native American tribes like the Salish and the Kootenai, who thrived in this region. In the 1800s, European explorers arrived and trade routes and fur trading posts emerged. Located near Missoula, Seely Lake was officially founded in 1892, primarily due to logging industry growth. However, in the mid 20th century, as logging declined, it transitioned into a popular tourist destination. The next and final day of our trip, we woke up early in order to make good time as we'd be covering over 50 miles. Today would be almost entirely along the side of the highway, something I wasn't looking forward to, but that would make those miles a lot easier. We started out riding south along Highway 83. It was a relatively quiet road with a decent shoulder, and it started out beautiful as well, with a long stretch along Salmon Lake, but as we continued, the terrain became more dry and the trees less frequent. Eventually we arrived at the end of Highway 83 in Clearwater, Montana, 
and stopped at the clear water stop and go. The gas station had this cool metal cow sculpture out front, but apart from that, Clearwater was a community so small you couldn't even really call it a town. Turning west, joining Highway 200, we continued alongside the shoulder in this dry part of the country. Eventually, the scenery started to shift again as we went between Highway 200 and Force Roads to ride alongside the Backfoot River down 20 odd miles to Missoula. It was a beautiful ride, and I couldn't help but face my mixed feelings. I was sad that this trip was coming to an end, but I was also exhausted and excited to drive home, pack up, and head off for my freshman year of college. As we grew closer to Missoula, we realized that we were going to be cutting it close on time. You see, the rental car company would pick us up, but only within city limits, and only before 5 p.m. So as we rushed to make it to the city limits, the clock ticked on. At around 4.30 p.m., we realized we weren't going to make it as we were still a few miles from the city limits. Pulling to the side, my dad decided to call the rental car company and explain the situation. Thankfully, the employees were understanding and one of them volunteered to drive the slightly further distance to pick us up. After meeting at the designated spot, we thanked the employees and picked up the big van we had rented. Like a game of Tetris, we disassembled the bikes and folded the seats down, stuffing all of our stuff in the back. After grabbing some food, we headed out on the long drive home. I'll keep this part brief, but the drive home was also a special part of the adventure. I love a good road trip, and my family has a tradition of avoiding interstates, taking the road less traveled. We started out along the scenic Highway 12 through Lolo Pass, which bisects Idaho, following the Lakshire River, and it's this route that Lewis and Clark took all those years ago. It was a beautiful drive with vast stretches of undeveloped forest and wilderness. We even checked out this little like forest service museum as we proceeded down and across Idaho into rural eastern Oregon. In rural eastern Oregon, we camped out once more, listened to some crazy local radio channels, and eventually drove past the Malahir Wild Rife Refuge. It was here we took this photo playing off the fact that in early 2016, armed individuals led by Ammon Bundy seized and occupied it protesting federal land policies and sparking a national debate on public land use. The rest of the drive wasn't of much interest, and eventually we had made it home. Sadly, that means this adventure has come to an end. I really appreciate if you made it this far in the video. If you haven't seen the first three episodes, make sure to check out the full playlist on my channel. The next episodes I'll be releasing on this channel will probably be on my trips to Asia, Went to uh, five countries, got a lot of content uh, built up for that, or I guess like media, um, or on building my tiny house truck. Um, haven't made up my mind yet, but be sure to stay tuned. Hit the subscribe button uh, if you want to stay tuned. Also, the bell helps. Uh, but thanks for watching, and uh, take care.